This interview is for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress with Joseph Hester Smith, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps from June 1943 to December 1945. Today is Friday, February 8th, 2008, and we are in the television studio of WILL on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Harriet Williamson. Also in the studio are Henry Radcliffe, who is the videographer and director of sound and lighting, and Mr. Smith's wife, Laverne Elizabeth Roberts Smith. Um, I was wondering if we could start by you talking about your background, about your family, about your education, and anything else you would like to mention at this time. Well, I was born in Maywood, Illinois. Uh, in uh, 1923, so I'm now 84 years old. Um, my mother and father had uh, lived in Virginia, in the southern part of Virginia, in Charlotte County, and and they had moved along with a number of other people from the south to places in the north to, uh, uh, for, to get employment. And uh, my father landed in Maywood, Illinois, because there was a steel mill there, which uh, employed a number of uh, people, especially people who were moving uh, north from the south. And uh, he was uh, invited there uh, to come there because of my wife's um, uh, father. They had been friends for a long time from birth, <laughs> I'm told. And so uh, her, her father, Jack as he was called, told my father that there was employment and so he came there and eventually sent for my mother and uh, uh, and uh, so that was my first home in Maywood, Illinois. I remember a few things about my childhood there. They were uh, happy as far as I could tell uh, and uh, but uh, eventually my mother and father uh, separated. Uh, I think I was six or seven years old and I remember uh, taking a train trip, the first time I'd been on a train, to a faraway place and we eventually uh, stopped in in Virginia uh, where her mother, my mother's uh, mother, lived and that was the first time I'd met my grandmother in Charlotte County, Virginia. We, uh, we stayed there for a time, and my mother, who wished to, uh, uh, who planned to go on to Boston, where the matriarch of our family was, and that was her Aunt Beulah. Uh, Aunt Beulah had uh, lived in Boston so many years we often think that she was uh, right after those people who got off at Plymouth Rock. <laughs> and she was as stern and as puritanical <laughs> as, as any of, of, of those people were. Uh, but my mother went there uh, to join her and to find employment after her, the uh, separation from my father. And I remember we stayed uh, with our grandmother for a few years, and I began a sc uh, school in the, uh, in the elementary school in a country school of sort. I, was, I think I was about seven years old then. And I went through school, loved school. It was uh, <laughs> from the very beginning. And I was uh, considered a good student, or as they say, I was right smart. And so uh, at that time, very few people from the school went beyond that. That was sort of the end. 
And um, my mother had aspirations, and so did I, of going beyond that. And so she had heard of a school in um, another county, in Mecklenburg County, uh, which is called Thine Institute. And she had wanted to go there as a girl. I don't know how she heard, learned about it, but she said she had always wanted to go there, and so she was going to send me to Thine Institute. Uh, so I was sent off to boarding school. And it was convenient for her because she was a domestic and worked in, in you know, big families, uh, some historically significant people in Boston, as a matter of fact. And she, uh, uh, my first year was a marvelous one. I was uh, uh, like many of the other boarding school students whose mothers had to work, but who uh, could at least afford to send the children to boarding school. And the point of all of that was to uh, keep us off the streets, out of the street, and, mm -hmm. and to get a good uh, uh, formation mm -hmm. while the parents worked. Because mm -hmm. many of the, uh, our parents, and my mother particularly, uh, lived in, in those days. Uh, the maids lived uh, in the uh, house of the employer. And so it was a around the clock kind of thing. And so there, there was very little home life. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, boarding school became my home for all practical purposes. And uh, it was the boarding school that uh, formed me my early, early years, particularly. And so I entered Thine Institute uh, and uh, let's see, I've forgotten the year, uh, 37, I think it was, about 37, uh, I mean 37, about that. And I spent five years there, uh, five years before I was graduated, and it was a significant time in my life, uh, in many ways feeling uh, fatherless. and. Uh, and often motherless, especially when my mother became hospitalized. Mm. After my first year, my first year was uh, I think glorious. Uh, it was a school that believed in everyone working, notwithstanding how rich you might be. I, I, I should say, too, it was run by um, the United Presbyterian Board of Missions, so it was a, a Presbyterian school. Um, and the, um, uh, student body was made up, the boarding school, primarily of northern students, mostly from Philadelphia for some reason, mm -hmm. a few New Yorkers, uh, people from New Jersey, uh, not many from New England. I was about the one person, no, there was a, another person from Connecticut. But that constitute, constituted the student body. But my real education came in living in the dormitory, as they, as they called it. And uh, very soon I, I, I took to <laughs> to uh, learning uh, easily because I had, it was a sort of passion, particularly when I was living with my grandmother, that, that was perhaps the most desolate time of my life. There was a constant yearning, mother, father, and all sorts of things that I couldn't really understand. Uh, one of the things that saved me during that period, as I recall, was a, 
my my mom, my mother, uh, my grandmother, wrote to my mother and said, uh, uh, "Joe has read every piece of paper in this house, uh, up in the basement, and I mean, up in, upstairs in the attic, and every trunk that I could find something to read, and." Uh, and my mother would send packages wrapped in, 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 in paper, newspaper, Boston papers, and I'd take the papers and spread them out mm -hmm. and read all of those. Uh, it was like a hunger. And so she asked my mother if she could spare uh, some money so she could subscribe to a paper. And it was uh, the Richmond Times Dispatch. Mm -hmm. And you, you can't imagine what that did to me. Well, I say it helped me survive because all of a sudden I, I knew there was a world outside uh, beyond these confines. In this rural area, people are very insular and everything is, is, is uh, into isolated, it seemed to me. And there I found all sorts of things that were going on in the outside world. And, and, uh, and, it, and it became a part of our family, my, my grandmother particularly. Uh, there was a story about a bear uh, in the, a cereal, Blackie the Bear. And, and uh, whenever the paper would come, or at night we'd sit in the room, and my grandmother said, Joe, read to me about Black of the Bear. And I would read, and the other children, my sister who was with us, and I had two cousins who were there with me, uh, and, their, and her, their mother. And so I would read uh, to the family about Black of the Bear and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Well, that was my... I would say my first real education, other than the fundamentals in, in the little country school. And so uh, I then, as I say, said, went on to uh, Thine Institute. And there I found some of the most wonderful people at a time that I needed wonderful people. And most of them were white. And I say that because I point out the race because the encounters that I had later on with whites were so different from those that had formed me in Thine Institute. The principal, Frank Wilson, Dr. Wilson was the headmaster. The kindest, most gracious, long-suffering <laughs> person because boys, especially those, uh, some of those guys were just uh, a few steps ahead of the truant officers <laughs> and all of those people. <laughs> and they were sent there to, so, so some, somebody would uh, uh, keep them in line. And my, my favorite uh, teacher, one of my favorite ones, uh, my favorite one was my English teacher, Miss Wilson, who was the daughter of the principal. Stern person, but uh, I thought a marvelous teacher. She introduced me to so many things. I still have the book of poetry that that we use magic casements and magic windows into mm -hmm. to the world. And, uh, and she often says to some of the boys, this is not a reform school. <laughs> <laughs> Those who found difficulty shaping up. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were very kind, gracious, and, and, and worked hard to uh, uh, give us a good education, limited, 
particularly in science. They didn't have much <laughs> uh, science, but literature, I, I enjoyed uh, literature, of course, and social studies, and Latin, and, and, and rather good in math. I wasn't too good in math. Geometry was almost my undoing. <laughs> But uh, I came through and was valedictorian of my class. After five years, I, uh, uh, I graduated with honors. But I should go back and say that my first year, as I said, was glorious. The other four years were rather difficult because my mother became hospitalized. And um, I thought I was going to have to drop out mm. of school. But Dr. Wilson said, no, no, we will find a way. <laughs> we will find a way. And we found a way. I, I worked more than that one hour that everybody had to work. And there was a wood pile where you had to saw wood and chop wood. And, and uh, my job became that of... A, a fireman, a, a boiler. I mm -hmm. attended a, a boiler. The, the, this uh, school was called educational, so mine was over in the girls' dormitory, which was a safe distance from the boys' dormitory. Uh, and uh, so that became my job for about, uh, let's see, first uh, for three years. I had to take the wood in and stack it in my uh, boiler room and and keep the fire going and and I learned to bank fire what wood would keep the fire till the next day and I just learned so many things mm -hmm. and how to keep water in the boiler and all of that and so I was gaining a degree of confidence and and self-worth mm -hmm. as well, and that was very important. And then my last year, uh, Dr. Wilson came to me and said, Joseph, you have done so well. I'm going to promote you. <laughs> I'm going to pro promote you. So he uh, uh, Gave me uh, proposed that I uh, become the uh, the uh, study hall director of for the little boys in in, in the dormitory. We had mm -hmm. uh, 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 boys there who were in the elementary section of the boarding school, and uh, at night it was very difficult for them to stay in their rooms and study. And so he thought that somebody should be over them. So we had a room downstairs where I would gather them and bring them in. And if they had problems, their teacher would give me instruction, leave a note in the classroom saying, help uh, so-and-so with such-and-such. And, such. and I, I enjoyed that. But the main uh, job was to uh, keep them quiet. Some of them pretended to be reading, but it was primarily to keep them quiet during uh, study hall hours. And that was a, uh, a enjoyable job. Mm -hmm. I never thought I would be a teacher eventually, but <laughs> I look back on it and that was the beginning mm -hmm. of my teaching. Well, uh, after five years, I said I was valedictorian of my class, and, and uh, it was small enough that you could do everything. So, <laughs> and it didn't have to be very good. <laughs> you just had to be enthusiastic and willing. And so, I developed a number of of, of things. I was uh, I was in the dramatic club, and I did plays and. I was in uh, the choir and the chorus, the boys' glee club and everything. I was on the basketball team. It was that kind of place mm -hmm. you could explore your entire being. And, and it, 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 it was the most 
is most delightful. Now, this was in a, a place called Chase City, Virginia, in, in Mecklenburg County. Now, here are all these northern people in this southern place. So we learn about riding in the back of the bus, and we knew there were places in Chase City we, did, we couldn't go to. Uh, and the, uh, the theater the, the, uh, where the movies were shown, uh, people, uh, all black people had to sit up in the top. And that was a little difficult to take. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were so glad to have a chance to get off campus that <laughs> we endured that sort of uh, indignity. But it, too, was a part of my education. And so we, uh, um, when we got ready to go home, we used to just go as we pleased when school was out. And we decided that the best thing to do would be to charter a bus. And so we chartered a Greyhound bus that came on the campus. And there were enough of us to, <laughs> to board the bus and continue north uh, all, all the way through past the Mason-Dixon line. And so we didn't have to suffer the indignities mm -hmm. of uh, the uh, southern rules and regulations about giving somebody your seat or not being able to get on the bus until all the white people had gotten on and all of those things. It, it was... Uh, uh, great comfort because the uh, the first stop for all of us, I think, was in Trenton, New Jersey. So uh, then we began to thin out mm -hmm. all the way, and the final thinning was <laughs> uh, a, a girl who was in Connecticut and I in Massachusetts. <laughs> we would get a trailway and go the rest of the way. So that was the kind of thing, but it, uh, I learned about segregation. I knew about segregation. One of the things that I remember uh, most vividly was uh, once I was uh, alone, I don't know what year it was, and I was on the bus, and it was one of those Greyhound buses that had uh, a res uh, at an aisle that was recessed, and the back uh, there was a back seat along the ledge, somewhat like uh, where I'm sitting here now, and a straight aisle, and it was down, and the seats were up around it. And I was sitting in the back as I uh, as I <laughs> knew I should uh, sit and. And a white man came on, and the bus driver came to me and told me to get up and give him my seat. And I couldn't say, I said, well, I'm in the back of the bus. But I was the first person uh, in the nearest uh, uh, bus. And so I had sort of made a line halfway as back of the bus, but I wasn't far enough back. He made me uh, get up, and I started talking about the Constitution, of which I knew very little. And a black man in the back, he was sitting in the long seat in the back, said, son, uh, uh, come, come on back here. Go, and s s sit here on this old Gladstone. Uh, ain't nothing in here you can hurt. And so, he had a mm -hmm. Gladstone bag. I didn't know what a Gladstone was, but an old leather bag. He looked up, it was soft and yeah, clothed. Mm -hmm. So he put it down uh, there, and I sat on the uh, ledge on that Gladstone bag, my feet in the aisle, and really it was more comfortable than the seat <laughs> <laughs> all the way. But I, I remember uh, with so much thanksgiving uh, that black man who who got me out of that difficult situation. I rode comfortably on until I got 
beyond the Mason-Dixon line, safe up north. Well, that uh, uh, pretty much uh, sums up, uh, in a, a nutshell, I suppose, my my uh, high school education, which uh, meant so much to me. During the summers, I go somewhere and work, and uh, I remember the first job in the world was Atlantic City, New Jersey. I had friends in Philadelphia, and I stayed with them, and they took me to Atlantic City, where I almost starved until I found a job. And, um, and but uh, that was part of my formation as well. What happened to your mother? My mother was still in the hospital most of the time. It was long things. She had one thing or another, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And then after she uh, got out of the hospital, she was in a convalescent home for a number of years. As a matter of fact, she didn't come out until I was graduated uh, from high school. And we were beginning our life together, which was a significant uh, uh, time. And I, I want to say, during the time in high school, too, I developed all kinds of skills. Uh, I learned wash and iron. I learned to sew. My grandmother taught me how to mm -hmm. sew. Uh, so I would learned to do all those domestic things. I knew how to, uh, to go to the shop and get to put a half sole on shoes. I, my frayed collars with a razor blade and, and to, to, to turn the collar around and stitch mm -hmm. it back. All those kinds of make-do things uh, uh, for which I became most grateful later on. But uh, after graduation, I went on back to Boston and my mother and I my, and my sister. My sister was in boarding school for a short time with me. We went on to Boston and, and, and started trying to find a house. My mother was still uh, rather weak, but uh, she was looking for work. And so I became uh, the main source mm -hmm. of uh, employment at the time. Fortunately, I found a job at the Boston Port of Embarkation because this was in 42, the war was on, and someone told me that the uh, Boston Port of Embarkation was looking for, um, uh, for workers. And so I went and sound, uh, uh, signed up and soon found a job. And that was a great joy because then we had some income. We found found an apartment, and uh, my mother had a part-time job at first. And uh, we moved uh, to a house. I still have such fond memories of the place. It was on Symphony Road in Boston, just about a half block or so from Symphony, Symphony Hall. Oh, I, I love the place, just a plain apartment, but I had my room, my sister had her room, my mother had her room. I think we were the happiest that we'd been. The family, mm -hmm. which had been scattered and scrambling, had, had finally come together and we were on our way, I thought. Uh, I had two, two ambitions. One was, of course, to see that my family, my mother and my sister, uh, were housed and fed, at least. Mm -hmm. And the other was uh, just try to save some money to get to college. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but that was my ambition. That was my mother's ambition. Mm -hmm. uh, my father could never understand, I discovered later, why I wanted to go to college, because I had finished high school, and, and you know, that's, nobody in the family had done that. And then when I wanted to go to graduate school, he, he, he that just staggered his, his imagination. Uh, but uh, there I was. I had no ambitions at all about going into service because I had <laughs> business to take care of. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was going to do my duty when I was called. I was going. But I didn't think about it and, you know, and wonder 
where I should, to what service I should go into. Um, I just waited and worked and waited and worked. And finally, in, after about a year, uh, my number came up, as they say, and I went down to the, to the draft board, reported, and I was told when to um, report for examination. And uh, on the appointed day, I went down to uh, be examined. And we went through all kinds of tests. At one point, we were all in the huddle. Uh, this, I don't know, a room full of, of guys. Uh, mostly white, I think maybe one or two uh, black guys in it, uh, yeah, but mostly white guys. We were all in, a, as we would say in the Marines, in our skivvies <laughs> and standing around and, and uh, after a while someone called my name, Joseph Smith. And I looked around, uh, will you follow me please? I, followed him. It was a Marine. I don't, I don't remember now whether he was a corporal or a sergeant or his, his dress blue uniform. So he said, uh, I've called you out because uh, uh, you're, you're, you're very special already. I didn't know about recruiting and <laughs> they did that because I was called out from the midst. I said, yes. Um, uh, would you like to be a Marine? First of all, I don't know much about the Marines, except that it's part of the Navy, and I don't want any part of the Navy because all I could do there would be a cook. I said, I already know how to do that, and so I'd rather go someplace where I can learn something else, like drive a truck, for example. <laughs> I said, I don't know how to drive a truck. I said, so that would be some advancement. I said, but cook, no thing. He said, well, no, the Marines are a part of the Navy, but uh, uh, they, they give you the same training that they give all the others. There's no difference. You go to boot camp, you learn to train, and you, you become a, a, a fighter or a warrior or something. Uh, he said, no, it's, it's all the same. I said, hmm. And I, and of course, had done no research on the military, except I'd been in Boston and, and Navy people all around there, and I had known some Navy people, uh, and uh, I knew that most of them were stewards. And I don't, I had never seen, uh, I never talked to a Marine, because <laughs> at that time all of them were white. And all the white guys that I know knew were uh, my age, and we'd work together and, and bowled together, and all of that sort of thing. And uh, so Marines were were not uh, on my uh, screen at that time. But he talked to me about you completed high school. I started to say, hasn't everybody who's reached 18, I discovered later that that was not so. And, and my physical fitness and so So it was rather flattering <laughs> that he wanted me to, uh, to join the Marines. So I said, well, of course, the same training and, and all of that. Well, all right. So I became a Marine. And so I went back home and told my mother, uh, I've been recruited for the Marines. She said, oh, it's nice. Um, I don't know much about the Marines. I said, nor do I, uh, except as part of the Navy. Uh, and uh, they, they uh, 
I say, I guess they're the fighting part of the Navy on land. I say, this is the best that I can understand. So uh, I had a date at which time I was supposed to go leave Boston to go to camp. And this is where the great adventure began. Uh, we were to meet at a particular place in Boston as a group. And when I got there, the group consisted of about four white guys from different parts of New England, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, uh, I don't think any Vermonters were there, but Maine and New Hampshire. There was one uh, white, another white person from um, some place in Massachusetts, but out of Boston, wasn't in Boston. I was the only black person there and the only uh, person there from Boston at the time. And uh, so we stood around and finally went down to South Station and caught the uh, train uh, to go to Washington, D.C., the first leg of our journey. And uh, we, of course, sat together because one of the persons was in charge of us. He, he had papers and he was uh, in charge of the, the detail, as mm -hmm. we would say. Uh, we got to Washington, D.C., and we had to wait some time, it seems, for a train to go to Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And we waited and waited and waited. Finally, the train came. And we started boarding. We uh, started on, on, one of the, on one of the coaches. The person in charge of us stood by the uh, steps uh, and um, with the conductor while the rest of us started getting on. Two or three guys went ahead of me, and when I started, the conductor put his hand and said, no, where are you going? And I said, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, I mean, you can't, can't sit there. And so the person in charge said, what do you mean? You can't, you can't, you can't sit up here? No, he has to sit uh, somewhere else. I said, oh, oh. <laughs> now, I naively felt that, okay, I'm in the Marines now. It doesn't matter if I'm going mm -hmm. south. Uncle Sam is, is, is watching over me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he insisted, well, this person from Maine who was in charge, he said, well, if he sits there, we're going to have to sit there too. So because I'm in charge of the group, and we, we, we've got to stay together. Mm -hmm. So the uh, conductor relented, got on. So I got on the train with the rest of my new buddies. And there were just a few men on the train, white men. reading newspapers and glaring at me. Uncomfortable, but I ignored it. We just talked together, anticipating what we were going to get into in uh, our uh, marine induction. The camp. Well, we went on and on and on until I heard uh, uh, the conductor say, I think it was Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Now, I had papers which said I was supposed to transfer to Rocky Mount, 
but I didn't know. I thought they had papers too. It said Rocky Mountain. I said, well, here's where we get off. And I started getting ready. I said, no, 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 we, we're, we're going to, uh, we don't get off here. I said, well, I'm supposed to get off here. Said, How is that? And he took my papers. He said, I don't understand this. And I said, I don't either. He said, we're going to Paris Island. I said, I don't know anything about Paris Island. Mm -hmm. He said, but that's where we're going. That's where the Marine Corps camp is, boot camp. And the other guy said, yes, they, all, they were going to Paris Island. I said, well, I'm supposed to get off here. We were all in a quandary, you know, as what was going on. And it still hadn't struck me, because he said it was going to, the, the recruiter said it was going to receive the same training. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be in the same camp. Mm -hmm. So I took leave of my uh, fellow enlistees and got off the train, began to feel lonely again, isolated. So I got off the train and just walked back and forth right where I got off, back and forth, back and forth. And I saw no people in the, in the station. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, there weren't many people who were on the train anyway, so I thought this was just an isolated station, not like South Station in Boston, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. a million people is a small place. And so I waited and waited, and after a while, the train came. And lots of coaches, some were actually empty, just one or two people and others. And so I started hurrying to to get on board and conductor, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to I think it was Jacksonville. That's where uh, that was the next stop, Jacksonville. He said, I mean, you you can't sit up here. You have to go down there. You see those people there? You follow them. And I looked down and there looked to me like hundreds of black people who were apparently in the back of the station because I hadn't seen anybody mm -hmm. at the time and I hadn't gone to the back. I just mm -hmm. walked back and forth along the track. They were streaming uh, out to the train and they were all going to one coach and I said, I said, they can't all get in that coach. <laughs> there are too many. You, you go to, if, you, if, you, if you're going to ride in this, that's where you go. Oh, boy. So I went on down, <laughs> followed them. And it was the most wretched experiences. There were women with babies and bundles and boxes. And uh, it was and it was in August, mm. hot. North Carolina is hot, hot, hot in, in August. And we got in there crammed in as, you can't imagine how, it was inhuman. And some men uh, went through and sat, got in, there was a baggage car, there was a, uh, I think it was, there was an engine, and I don't know whether there was a coach between the engine and us or not, but then there was a back car. Some men went back and sat in the baggage car. But we were squeezed in, and the windows were open to get in air, and all you got uh, uh, were, were cinders, you know, mm -hmm. flying in from the track. It was a miserable journey, and I felt sorry for the people. I was feeling sorry for myself, and I said, this is not a good way 
for me to start off fighting for my country. Mm -hmm. I began to re rethink the whole thing, but you know, it's too late now. Now I say this because I knew about discrimination. I've already recounted uh, about my experiences in Virginia, but I'd never seen anything this vicious. It just seemed cruel, especially when there was space. Mm. They could have still discriminated <laughs> and just given more space to people, but no, all crammed into one car. So I went down, uh, I, I got on the train, I got off at Jacksonville. The bus was there to pick us all up. I went to camp and then I, I realized that this was a separate, a separate camp. Mm -hmm. The white Marines, my buddy had gone to another camp and this is where I was going. And that it was a new camp because Marines had just recently been permitted and this was strange to me, being permitted to join. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't understand because I, I didn't come and say, will you please uh, uh, allow me to enter the Corps? Mm -hmm. I beg of you. I was drafted into the service and the Marine came and got me. So I couldn't understand why. Uh, I was being treated as an unwelcome person or a person being bestowed upon in a condescending way, a high privilege. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't see it. it, it and that, that was in the air, a high privilege of being selected to be a Marine because they're the best of all military people. Well, I was in the Marines in boot camp. Boot camp is supposed to tear you down and remake you. Uh, to tear you down, assuming that you, uh, it seemed to me that you had nothing worth bringing to the core in the first place, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, but the remake you into a marine, and there were some things that I uh, saw the value of, and that was unity, teamwork, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But there were some things which were, uh, which under the guise of of training and discipline was simply sadistic, you know. <laughs> that was plain and simple. Somebody mm -hmm. took it out on some people because, you know, it's like uh, initiation or uh, uh, harassment. There was a great deal of that. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's all supposed to be in instructive. But not everybody needs the same kind of <laughs> discipline, et cetera. Uh, the assumption seemed to be that you were nothing and here you are and we're going to make you into something mm -hmm. or, what, or whatever you were, we're going to strip you down of that and then form you in our image. And I resisted that uh, psychologically. And the way I survived it was to say, what is it that you expect of me? At inspection, what am I supposed to? I'm supposed to have my, 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 my person squared away, as we say, uh, clean, <laughs> everything in order, etc. Uh, my rifle is supposed to be clean and safe. I'm supposed to know the manual of arms, whatever. I'm going to learn it. So you won't give me any fuss. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear anything from anybody reprimanding me about it, no reprimands. And so I squared myself away, found out what I was supposed to do, and I did it with all the dignity. 
but I was, I was not going to take away, let anybody take away my personhood, my, mm -hmm. my, my fundamental virtues. I knew I brought something that I thought was of value to uh, my country, if it were not to the Marines. Mm -hmm. But that was it. And on top of that, I, all Marines, I suspect, undergo that. I haven't found anybody who's mm -hmm. going to. But it was particularly grueling for those first ones of us who were in Montfort Point because we had to prove ourselves worthy. The commandant and all of the senior officers resisted it to high heaven. No, no, no. We don't want them. President Roosevelt pushing it, but not too, <laughs> mm -hmm. too much because he wanted the Southern vote. Um, And I think settled for the segregation that they eventually set up. At least they are there. And the NAACP and, uh, uh, was especially vigilant about, and I think some other civil rights organizations were, were telling them, these are Americans, they are men, and part of the Ameri uh, their being a good American is to, is to serve their country in any of its uh, uh, organizations. And that is how <laughs> I discovered later, that's how the Marines <laughs> reluctantly open themselves up. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who were pioneering it, pioneering at that mm -hmm. point, uh, uh, well, we suffered. But I survived boot camp. And in boot camp, I learned uh, fire a rifle, called a cleaner rifle, M1. That was something new. I didn't know what I would do with that when I got back to Boston, but <laughs> it was a useful uh, thing to know if I ever got in combat. Um, I worked in a carbine, or a carbine, a carbine, carbine, I think they call it, another small, small arm rifle, not as accurate as the M1, but handier. And I learned to fire, uh, uh, I think it was a 45 automatic. I learned, oh, let's see, what else do we, in the firearms? Oh, I, there was an automatic r rifle uh, called the BAR, B-A-R, Browning Automatic Rifle. Mm -hmm. I learned to fire it. Uh, so I learned to use firearms, and I learned to drill. We drilled and drilled and drilled. I learned to stand guard and the responsibility of, of being a guard and not to fall asleep, <laughs> because that was, uh, they made us think that that was uh, offense almost. Uh, requiring capital punishment, uh, but uh, and I found out later that some people <laughs> uh, overseas, particularly uh, most people who that I knew who were in the brig, uh, was uh, were there because of sleeping on guard duty. Well, anyway, we left uh, eventually uh, there in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Montford Point camp. I refused to go on liberty. I, I simply said, I'll never mm -hmm. go into Jacksonville again until I'm going out mm -hmm. of it. And so I never went out on liberty. I stayed in camp. On one occasion, I left Camp uh, Lejeune during my whole uh, uh, stay there from boot camp until after boot camp before we started 
our, our trek overseas. Uh, I heard that my grandmother, uh, uh, I didn't know the geography too well, but I learned that my grandmother lived close enough to North Carolina, the part of Virginia that she was in, was close enough to uh, North Carolina that with a 72-hour leave, I could get there and get back. And I wanted to see her before I went overseas because it was probably, and it was mm -hmm. the last time I saw her. So I ventured out on the bus again, some of the same treatment. <laughs> I thought I'd learn. <laughs> I, I, uh, I knew I had to sit in the back of the bus, <laughs> but I learned another custom. The bus driver was in the front, and I went and gave him my ticket and started to get on. No, you go in the side mm. door. Uh, <laughs> couldn't even walk through mm. the bus. So, but anyway, I took the bus, got back, and saw my grandmother. But there's another confusing thing. I got to a little place uh, where I was supposed to get off uh, in Wylisburg, uh, Virginia. Just a store, uh, just a, like a juncture uh, in the road. And I knew that my grandmother didn't live too far from there. So I got off uh, the bus and went to this little general store. And a man said, can I help you? I said, well, yes. He, he could see I was uh, a Marine. And I said, I have a grandmother who lives somewhere around here. I don't know exactly in which direction. I don't know whether I can walk there or whether there's a cab or something, but I'd like to see her. He said, what's her name? I said, Etta Rice. Oh, I know her. I said, you do? Oh, yeah. I know everybody. <laughs> and I guess he did. Yeah. He said, well, if you aren't in a hurry, I'll take you out there. I'm going out that way. Now, this was a white man. <laughs> so, uh, what do you do mm -hmm. and when do you do? Mm -hmm. It's all mm -hmm. mixed up. Mm -hmm. And so he took me to a pickup truck. I got in there. He didn't tell me to sit in the back of the pickup truck. <laughs> I sat beside him. He took me over. He said, let me off. He said, you walk down that, that this little dirt road, this little lane, more like a lane, and you get into the house. I thanked him for very much. Mm -hmm. So I saw my grandmother uh, before I left. And I, I don't even remember getting how I got back to camp, except that I got back on time, because that was the scary part. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't get back on and time. This interview is for the Veterans <laughs> Soon after History that. Project of the Library of Congress and is with Joseph Hester Smith, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps from June 1943 to December 1945. Today is February 8th, 2008, a Friday. We are in the television studio of WILL on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. And this is part two of this interview. My name is Harriet Williamson. Also in the studio are Henry Radcliffe, videographer and director of sound and lighting, and Mr. Smith's wife, Laverne Elizabeth Robert Smith. Um, when we left off, you were mm -hmm. talking about uh, visiting your grandmother mm -hmm. in uh, Virginia mm -hmm. and then heading back to um, Monford Point Camp. Yes. And I wanted to ask you um, about the camp. I'm not clear where it is in relationship to Camp Lejeune. And I also wanted to ask you if you were, if you had seen Camp Lejeune and if there was a comparison between the conditions 
at Munford Point versus Camp Lejeune. And also, if you knew if there was any difference in the way you were housed or fed or clothed or equipped or trained mm -hmm. as compared to the Marines that were at Camp Lejeune. And how long were you there before you um, were shipped mm -hmm. overseas? I, I probably, I know I've confused you. When I say Camp Lejeune and Montfort Point, uh, I'm speaking of the same place. Well, I, I know they're the, okay, so they are geographically the same place, but yeah. one is the segregated place and the, one is the... No, Camp Lejeune uh, was the segregated place and Montford Point was the uh, 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 the basic training camp. Okay. Uh, it's Montford Point is <laughs> the point is on Camp Lejeune. Whites were trained at Paris Island. Uh, okay. Whites were tra trained you. at Paris Island. Mm -hmm. And so now, th there were undoubtedly whites in s parts of Camp Lejeune because there weren't enough, <laughs> enough black Marines there to uh, keep the whole camp going. Mm -hmm. But it was primarily at that time for, uh, for the training uh, of, of uh, black Marines. Uh, so our address was, uh, Camp Lejeune, Montford Point, uh, it was Montford Point, Camp Lejeune, I've forgotten okay. which, but it's one in the same place. And whites were, uh, had their training at Paris Island. Which now, is how a, far away is Paris Island? I don't know. Okay. I, it is a considerable distance. Okay. There was a, a, a place not too far from Camp Lejeune, which was called Cherry Point. At that time, that was where flyers were trained, Marine Corps mm -hmm. pilots were trained, that, and that was closer to Camp Lejeune, I understand, than was uh, Paris Island. Mm -hmm. But the camp had just been developed. We didn't have uh, even, um, we had no barracks at the time. There was sort of tar paper huts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that's what they looked like, made of tar paper, and they were black, and they were in the heated sun, and they were hot, and, and, and miserable kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. They, uh, I often thought that tents <laughs> might have been better, mm -hmm. but they were sort of uh, tar paper huts, it uh, seemed to me. And I've forgotten how many men were in the hut, but all in rows, just like you have in any camp. Mm -hmm. And the... Uh, the whole place was uh, just recently developed. They had to find a place, and there was a great. Uh, 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 <laughs> there was a federal case involved in, in finding a spot, and so they uh, they put us uh, out there in the place we say in the boondocks uh, with the mosquitoes. There was a great deal of swamp land mm -hmm. there, and so mosquitoes were prevalent. Uh, the, f the first <laughs> first battle that was uh, that that the, that the Marines fought, I always thought was with the mosquitoes. There was a mosquito patrol. Uh, the men would go out uh, and, and and spray every uh, in the woods and swamp spraying, and they come back and uh, well, they they were blacker than uh, anybody. I mean, just covered with. with, with the, that uh, that spray, so it was uh, it was very very primitive. Mm -hmm. um, at uh, Paris Island, uh, they had better living conditions, but they had other pests. They had mm -hmm. sand fleas. I understand, mm -hmm. uh, but the living conditions were basic. But uh, I don't think anybody was even bothered by that because. Uh, when you're drilled all day and you're running, if, uh, mm -hmm. when you go into the hut, <laughs> sleep, you sleep, <laughs> and you're mm -hmm. up early in the morning, out again. So the conditions there were 
uh, I think rather primitive, but uh, they're, they're livable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, don't, I heard nobody complain about mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the conditions, the, the heat or anything. And we didn't have anything to compare it to, really, because mm -hmm. we had never been to uh, uh, any other Marine Corps camp. And so uh, we, we survived that. Uh, that was not a problem, but uh, you and it was difficult to keep those things. Uh, even even when you clean them, they didn't look clean somehow <laughs> because uh, it's just just dull places. So we were uh, ready now to start to go overseas, and I. I would say you, the, one of the questions you asked was, how long was I in uh, Camp Lejeune, mm -hmm. <laughs> Montford Point Camp, Montford Point Camp Lejeune, New River, North Carolina, in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's all, it's all of that. Uh, there's a little river that goes right by the point, and so that was part of our address. Um, we, uh, I lost my train of thought. Did we were getting, getting ready to uh, go overseas. And I, for, from June of 43, uh, I was there, through boot camp, I think I've forgotten how many weeks to through through August, September. I remember in October, I think we were in New Orleans. So we left Monfort Point sometime between uh, August and October, I think, probably September. It was probably September, because I think my, my, my birthday is October 5th, and I think we were in New Orleans at that time, as I recall. But uh, so, uh, that was about the time that we were, not much time mm -hmm. to, to strut around and be a, mar be a Marine in the United States. Nobody ever saw me in uniform, N none of my family saw me in uniform, but once, when I came home after boot camp. Mm -hmm. So, so you were able, now this is not visiting your grandmother, but this is going back to Boston? It was Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, right after boot camp, I went back and saw my, uh, my family, mother and sister, and I was in uniform then. And the next time, yes, the next time they saw me, I was discharged. I, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd been discharged. Now, were you but, able to stay in contact with your mother and your sister through letters? Through? Writing letters? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, letters were, uh, <laughs> you know, email, and, and I think that was what it was called. And uh, yes, I wrote, uh, I don't know how often, but I didn't tell them about any of this, mm -hmm. <laughs> none of this. Uh, so I'm doing well, et cetera, where I am and where I'm going. And so, yes, if we, I think it was around September that we started out our journey overseas. And we were told that we were going to embark from New Orleans. So that meant we had to catch a train from uh, Jacksonville, 
North Carolina to New Orleans. Somehow we got to, got on the train, and I remember it as a long and boring train ride. But then another traumatic thing happened. And I think I know that stayed with me longer than anything else that happened to me in the Marine Corps. <laughs> I look back, I'm almost embarrassed to, to say it, but it, but it did. It, it, uh, it was a deep wound. Um, we were, we reached Tupelo, Mississippi. Pretty certain of Tupelo. And the train stopped for some reason. And up on the embankment was a um, canteen by the um, American Red Cross. Big sign, welcome servicemen such and such a chapter, uh, American Red Cross. And there were this mounds of donuts and urns of coffee. Wow. After, you know, grueling ride, we, we, we would get out and stretch our legs, I thought, and go up the embankment, line up, and, and, and get uh, some coffee and donuts. And the train remained there on the tracks. And we were waiting for the order <laughs> to go up and get the donuts. After a while, a man came down from uh, the hill, the embankment, came down the tracks. and He walked the entire length of the train looking he saw nothing but black marines he went back up the embankment and they closed the place down <laughs> like out of business I don't think I, <laughs> I don't know why that hurt so, and hurt so long mm -hmm. was, was the thing. And it hurt for two reasons. Not only were we snubbed by or rejected by the American Red Cross, not one of our officers that we had there were no Marine Corps officers, or black Marine Corps officers at that time. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have, we, we had acting sergeants in our outfit, uh, black acting sergeants. We didn't even have a full sergeant at the time. And so you see how new uh, we were to the Marine Corps. We hadn't, uh, we didn't have a, uh, have the uh, full list of non-commissioned officers, and our commissioned officers were, were white, and remained that throughout my tenure in the Marines. I mean, there were, there were no black officers in the Marine Corps until November the year that I was discharged, a person was commissioned a lieutenant mm -hmm. in November. I was uh, so, but so I never saw one. I never saw a, a, a black officer. As a matter of fact, I never saw a top uh, uh, non-commissioned officers. I never. I saw one 
gunnery sergeant during my entire duty, one black gunnery sergeant. And he was one who would come from the States to replace us in Numea, New Caledonia. And it was the first time we seen it, we, we hooped it up. Mm -hmm. A gunnery sergeant. It, it was a proud moment because our, uh, our gunnery sergeant, who was white, had told us, somebody said, hey, say, Gunny, we call him gunnery sergeant Gunny. Gunny, we heard that there's, there's, there's a Negro, uh, we were Negroes in that time, but there was a Negro uh, uh, gunnery sergeant back in the States. No, he said. That's, that's what I heard. Well, when I see you, one of you people with three up and three down, I'm going to eat my stripes. <laughs> <laughs> and so we yelled when we saw this guy. He said, Connie, no, no, three up and three down. Eat him, eat him. <laughs> Connie said, no, I guess I'll keep him. <laughs> it was one of those, those, those high moments. Uh, you see. So, but anyway, back to Tupelo, Mississippi. No white officer. I expect them to get off the train mm -hmm. and say, feed my men. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I fully expected. Mm -hmm. And when they didn't, I lost all respect for those guys. Mm -hmm. The only respect I gave them was what was due to them as a superior officer, from, but as, as a human being. A man, mm -hmm. and man. I, I could not. I don't know whether they hid themselves or what they did, but not a one made a move. Now, to me, a good officer would say, These are my men. Mm -hmm. You say, Welcome, servicemen. They're servicemen. I'm lining them up, and you're going to serve them. Mm -hmm. But they didn't do it. And I said, we're going overseas with this type of leadership. Those New England, that New England guy had more courage in telling the conductor, mm -hmm. we're going to sit together. He's going to sit with us or we're going to sit with him. than those Marine Corps officers mm -hmm. did. And I wrestled with that, and no matter how I turned it, it came out the same way. They had absolutely no respect for us, or they would have gone, because there were no other white Marines, or they, we were still the discriminated, mm -hmm. or there were no other white guys around. All they had to do was line us up and, 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 and uh, go up the hill, get some coffee and donuts. So it was one of those things that I could not shake. Every time I turned it around, it stuck mm -hmm. with me. But anyway, we left there and went on to uh, New Orleans. Uh, we were, uh, we went over to Algiers, right across the river. Uh, and Algiers is a n naval receiving station, so we were over on the Navy. Uh, side of uh, New Orleans and there all we did was occasional drilling and people went on Liberty in New Orleans. I had never been to New Orleans and I was anxious some boys uh, uh, we were told to stay together you know one or two guys not I go off alone so there, I've forgotten with whom I went, but his interests were, were not my interests. Uh, and, and that's one of the things you get in the Marines, who are very anxious. And the other thing is uh, the composition of, of uh, the uh, platoon or the company I was in. It was practically all Southern boys. And, and I think mm -hmm. that was true throughout. Uh, <laughs> 
And it's also true that the Marine Corps uh, uh, power structure made up of Southerners, uh, the officers in it, so they're primarily Southern. Mm -hmm. uh, and my officer, my platoon uh, leader, or my company uh, officer, did some spiteful things. He talked around how, how much better Southern boys were than Northern boys. And I don't think there were two of, who have, uh, uh, three of us. There was a boy from New Jersey, one from Chicago, and myself. All the rest of them were Southern boys. And he'd talk about them. And I had one buddy who was in, <laughs> call him a name, <laughs> you know, trying to divide us, you know. <laughs> It was insidious. Well, anyway, I went on Liberty once in New Orleans, and we were there for, I don't know how long we were in New Orleans. I so regret I had a log. I kept a log in the house. And it, <laughs> it was one of the casualties in a flood that we had in our basement. Mm -hmm some years ago. <laughs> I just thought about it. <laughs> we had one <clears throat> uh, day before yesterday, and that's when I lost all my little notes about uh, my trip details. Uh, Was it like a journal? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I called it my log, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it was, it was a journal, it was, it, except that it wasn't daily. It was uh, more uh, event by event, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, all of New Orleans that I saw at that time was Rampart Street, which was <laughs> a denizen of all kinds of things that servicemen <laughs> look for. It was it was not the USOs or the what what is, the canteens or mm -hmm. something the dives and that. So after that trip, I didn't go back. I, I didn't go to New Orleans anymore until I was free. <laughs> and so we left New Orleans. We boarded an, an unusual ship for going overseas. It was an LST, it's a landing ship tank. They're not usually used for transporting uh, troops long distances. Uh, they're, for, they're good for hopping from one island to, mm -hmm. to, to the next, for carrying men and cargo, but for long trips. Uh, well, it takes a long time, and you have to do, make lots of stops. Well, that was, in a sense, good. Is that us. an open ship? Is there cover on, on an LST? An L LST is uh, one of the ships, one, that it opens in front, mm -hmm. in bow, and it has a deck that is pretty open on which you store. We had an LCT store on top of it, which is a landing mm -hmm. uh, uh, craft, a small landing craft. Uh, it's, uh, you know, you see it, uh, it looks pretty large uh, when it's alone, but when it's <laughs> with other me seagoing ships, mm -hmm. it, it's rather small. Um, but it was comfortable as anything. One of, one of the things that uh, boot camp uh, prepared us all for, I'm sure, was discomfort. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, discomfort turned into 
comfort eventually. I mean, it was, it was relative. You, you, you don't, uh, you don't even think about comfort. You, you take it and you, you make comfort out of uncomfortable situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were, uh, we were told when we got on 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 board the LST that we were the guests of the Navy and that we should conduct ourselves as guests. Uh, we were supposed to stay in the in fore part of the ship. The Navy uh, was, had the aft uh, part of the ship. Uh, and uh, so we should behave ourselves as guests. Um, that lasted for a few weeks, I don't know why, but eventually we were all over. And I think it was because they wanted us to scrape and paint the entire deck rather than just the fore part of, <laughs> of the ship. Mm -hmm. And because that was what we did, we did a lot of scraping and painting of the deck uh, after. We, been out to sea for some time. Uh, but we left New Orleans, and the, and the date is, I've lost that too. Uh, but we went on down to the Panama, uh, to Panama. Uh, we stopped uh, before we went through the canal at uh, the name won't come to me now, but we stopped there for a long, for maybe a few weeks. That's where we got off and did some jungle training because we had never trained in any jungles mm -hmm. before. Uh, so we had our rifles and packs and go into the jungles of, of uh, Panama. Uh, Colon was a place not too, place, not too far from, I think it was a city, uh, not far from the base. Uh, and it, it, I think it was a submarine base, fundamentally, but we docked there. And uh, so we go out in the jungle and, you know, from, Get familiar with that uh, foliage and, and the creatures <laughs> in the jungle and all of those kinds of things and how to survive in it, you run out of water, what things to uh, get out of plants, uh, uh, just some liquid to live, and how to get through uh, the jungle without killing yourself with machete, trying to <laughs> cut your way through. Uh, Useful things, I thought, uh, and um, I I appreciated uh, that kind of of exercise in the in the jungle of Panama. Then we uh, and I went on liberty once to the place where we were permitted to go. We weren't permitted to go into Panama City. It was off limits or. Uh, bounds for Marines, I guess for all Marines. I'd like to think for all Marines, um, but uh, we couldn't go into the city, the, the large city. Um, but there was enough, as far as I was concerned, in this other small city where I visit, visited just once, one night, and that was enough for me. Uh, I won't go into all the, the, the uh, Marine Corps details of, of uh, those places like any other place where servicemen uh, have liberty. Uh, then we got on, on board L LST and through the canal and on to Fiji. We stopped at Fiji, but we didn't 
uh, get off at Fiji, or, or we didn't dock at Fiji. We were there one or two days, and uh, some of the, uh, we were permitted to go ashore if we wanted to. Uh, some of the men did. I didn't. Uh, we were out at sea, so you had to go, you know, over a rope ladder I mean, down the side of the ship, the rope down into a boat, and the boat would take you ashore. The guys who were looking for something to drink were particularly <laughs> anxious to find whatever aboard uh, they could. And at that time, I didn't drink, and so I couldn't see <laughs> any reason to, to go running around on Fiji looking for uh, uh, a drink, um, and uh, <laughs> there was one incident in which one of the Marines came back quite inebriated. I mean, he he was so inebriated he couldn't. Uh, b they brought him back, put him in the boat, and he couldn't climb the ladder, and uh, and so they 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 uh, threw. Uh, 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 ropes down and hauled him up. <laughs> uh, so I dragged him in and took him in and, and uh, down below and threw him in his sack. And this was the first uh, uh, example that I saw of, of what uh, some Marines uh, considered a virtue. Our gunnery sergeant, who had served in China, and he had many, many years in the service, of course, it had been his life, he said. And uh, his youthful oh, white gunnery sergeant, of course. And he pointed the sky out the next day when we had to fall out for inspection. Oh, Amit, I want to point out to you a good Marine. Yesterday we had to haul him up on, uh, in, uh, into the ship, but this morning he squared away. That's what I call a good marine. <laughs> that, 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 I can't believe I was. I was <laughs> but, to me, that was a detrimental depths of degradation. Why anybody would go and get something, but. Another ethic, you see, mm -hmm. or I mean, Gunny thought that was a, a, a way a good Marine did. Go on, get drunk, but uh, be able to stand uh, uh, inspection the next day. Uh, but anyway, we stopped at Fiji, and that incident, then we went on to Oh, where we stopped in American Samoa. We stopped at uh, Tahiti. I'm not sure whether the order is correct. But the place that I remember most fondly was Bora Bora. Bora Bora was the most beautiful <laughs> little place I've ever seen. The, the, there was a lagoon. That was so, so peaceful and inviting. You, you wanted to just dive in and, and, and go as far as you could. It was, it was that kind of enchanting lagoon. And the island was sort of like a uh, curve, like a horseshoe. And, and uh, it was dominated by, uh, by a ridge, a mountain of sorts. And, we got up, we decided we wanted to go uh, uh, exploring. A couple of us got, uh, went ashore and, and climbed up the mountain. I'd never uh, climbed a mountain before, uh, or I suppose to mountain climbers this would be just a ridge. There was just one little peak that was covered by cloud. 
Uh, but we went there, and I didn't know the mountains had such various parts. We <laughs> From shore, it just looked like an easy uh, mm -hmm. hike. We got into brush that was so thick you couldn't, you could hardly see, you could, couldn't penetrate. You, <laughs> you know, this is the mountain. Where you went through that, and then there was a barren section, you know, and on it. And it was a pleasure to get up to the top. And there was a place where we, we thought it was a machine gun up, up on one of the knolls and discovered that it was simply a, a fake, <laughs> a fake gun. <laughs> I said, that would do a lot of good. They should be attacked. Uh, but Bora Bora was a very pleasant experience, as I remember. And uh, I always wanted to go back to it. Uh, but uh, we left there and on down to Numea, New Caledonia. And that was where we were to camp. We were there. I really don't know how many months. It seemed like a year. But there a long time because that became home in many ways. Uh, there was a uh, it was a small village not too far from our camp. I went there maybe three times during the whole time. Uh, there was an American Red Cross there that. I think they gave out cigarettes to servicemen. I didn't smoke at that time. I don't know. But uh, um, I think they gave men cigarettes. I used to go to, there was a park with a bandstand on, on Sunday, I think it was, and there'd be a band, just that, and, and the people would come out and <laughs> it was an interesting custom. Uh, young uh, uh, men and women would, would uh, promenade the bandstand, and the parents were sitting out chaperoning, and they would <laughs> just walk around. That was a courtship mm. <laughs> custom, and just, just <laughs> around and around and around. I thought was was interesting. And, but Numea, New Caledonia was a very, uh, it was a peaceful place, but we did what we were supposed to do, and there we came into our real service. And I haven't said anything about that. I discovered later that the depot company that I was in was a service company and that we were not expected to do any combat. Mm -hmm. Combat was a privilege reserved for regular Marines. The irony is that at Montfort Point there had been developed two uh, so-called combat mm -hmm. outfits, the 51st and the 52nd Defense Battalion. Mm -hmm. There men learned communications, they learned about uh, the guns and you know all the kinds of things, and I think they had a rifle company. Uh, but anyway, it was in every sense, a bona fide combat mm -hmm. unit, 51st and 52nd Defense Battalion. They went overseas. They sent them overseas to an isolated rock after the action go, and they <laughs> stagnated. Mm -hmm. They saw no action. People in ammunition companies, the, the people who lifted mm -hmm. <laughs> the boxes and all, ammunition companies and depot companies like mine, 
were in more action. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were in action, and the others, no action at mm -hmm. all, unless they transfer it to an ammo company or a depot company. And, but we, uh, we worked on, uh, in um, New Maya, New Caledonia. In the morning we'd get up and there were always ammunition to move from one place to another or ammunition to destroy ammunition that had been left there so long that it was dangerous to, to use. And the way of salvaging it was to, or, to, or getting rid of it, was to take it out and dump it in the sea. Boy, the sea. <laughs> Lots of stuff in it. I said, there must be a better way. But that was the way. Mm -hmm. Just dumped it. Uh, shells uh, and uh, hand grenades and all sorts of munitions. Uh, dumped. You see, we did a lot of that. A lot of guard duty, guard duty, guard duty, guard duty. And sometimes it just seemed like it was make do guard duty because you said, what am I guarding? I mean, I said, this is my post. I don't see anything mm -hmm. but coconut trees. No, no, not many coconut trees in uh, there. That was Guadalcanal later. But in Numea, New Caledonia, there wasn't much there to do but but work and bayonet practice. We did a lot of bayonet practice. You think that one thing if we had been attacked we would have had a fighting chance at least. Mm -hmm. So we and that was due to our gunnery sergeant. Not all gunnery sergeants uh, even taught black marines much about bayonet uh, practice beyond boot camp. But we had bayonet practice, we even had bayonet practice on board the LST. Mm. And that's dangerous. I mean, the ship lilting and you mm -hmm. parrying and thrusting, uh, all those kinds of things. <clears throat> and I guess primarily to cut down on the boredom. I don't think anybody thought that we'd ever use <clears throat> a bayonet in combat. But uh, we stayed on Numea, New Caledonia for a long time. I don't know how long. But then we were relieved by a unit in which this <laughs> gunnery sergeant, the black gunnery sergeant I told you about, that we had never, we, we'd never seen a a black gunnery sergeant before. <laughs> it was a high moment. We left there and went to Guadalcanal. <clears throat> More of the same. Guard duty, munitions. No, I made a mistake. It was not in Numea, New Caledonia that we dumped ammunition in the in this sea. It was in uh, Guadalcanal. Uh, that we just sh stored lots of ammunition and moved this there and all kinds of look like busy work. I guess it had meaning, but I never knew the meaning of it. And mine not to reason why, <laughs> mine but to do or die. And so let me see. We remained on Guadalcanal for a period. We then got on board ship and traveled a long, long time till we reached Okinawa. That was where the action was. That's where we saw combat. We uh, D-Day on Okinawa, I think, was April 1st. I remember it. April Fool Day, 
I guess in a sense it was because we thought, we, uh, the Marines thought they were going to encounter Japanese the moment they hit the beach. <laughs> and they couldn't find the Japanese <laughs> on Okinawa when they landed. Where are they? <laughs> and so it was a rather peaceful landing. They didn't have to fight their way on the beach as usual. And uh, my outfit uh, didn't uh, arrive until uh, D-Day 30. Uh, we came in uh, May. I've forgotten what day. But we came in May, and that was, the fighting was in, in um, full force. I mean, it was, and there was constant noise. Ships out in the bay, boom, boom, boom. It was just constant noise uh, from um, the guns, the Navy sh shooting, and the shooting up in, up in the ridges, up in the hills. And uh, you just became accustomed to to that sound and and the thing that and again we were supplying uh, bringing food stuff from trucks putting them on shore and uh, we didn't unload ships they had another uh, 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 company to do that uh, uh, ammo uh, Company, ammunition company, black ammunition companies, uh, do that. So our land, our handling of those of things, not so much ammunition on Okinawa as uh, fuel and cans of food and that sort of thing. And bang, 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 constantly. We uh, felt rel relatively secure. Uh, we weren't too far from where the bloody stuff was taking place, but uh, we didn't feel in imminent danger except that kamikazes were trying to get through and and we were just hoping that the that the navy would uh, shoot them down before they got uh, to the island and most of the time they did there was one instance in which uh, a plane got through and dropped a bomb it was a small bomb i i think it was a personnel bomb I think he was aiming really for the camp, and a short distance from the camp was a fuel dump. We stacked up um, 100 octane uh, uh, airplane fuel, a distance from the camp. I'm glad it was <laughs> as far away as it was because that explosion sent the big cans up in the air and, and, and blowing them apart. And, one person in our camp got struck by a, a shrapnel, a piece of steel, I guess, from the drum, and got a scratch. Uh, we kidded him. Now, now I guess you go and brag about your wound <laughs> in, in, in combat. And, and I found that he was listed in one of the, as, as one of the wounded. <laughs> I remember how we laughed at him about, but none of us got, got wounded. But a lot of, a lot of scary moments, of course. But again, they kept us out. But some of the depot companies, Iwo Jima, guys had to fight. People who, who had the same kind of training that we had had, and who were supposed to do the same kind of thing that we were doing, had to fight. So in a sense, we were just lucky, I suppose. Mm -hmm. we, we were in combat, but not right up on the front lines. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to, we, we missed D-Day. Well, Okinawa, nobody had to fight to get on the beaches, but 
most of the places you had to fight just to get a foothold. And the, M, uh, and the depot companies and ammunition companies had to be close enough with the combat forces mm -hmm. that you got involved mm -hmm. because uh, uh, they, they are not, uh, the Japanese were not respecters of person, mm -hmm. creed, or color. <laughs> they belong to whomever it concerns. I think I read that there were more people killed or wounded who were so-called non-combatants -com than were so than they to, to brought the wounded. That there were more people who were killed or wounded who were involved in loading uh, ammo and such the things that you were involved in. Yes. Than those kind of companies, mm -hmm. the, 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 a, a number of them were wounded, some killed. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, some, some actually, when, when there was a breakthrough uh, for us, you know, they, they had to fight. And that's why I'm sure uh, we were trained mm -hmm. in how to use firearms and grenades and all that sort of thing because war doesn't go according to, mm -hmm. to, to Plan. you. Your plan, your, mm -hmm. your best wishes. They are over there, and we're over here. Sometimes those people over there come over here, and then it's every uh, every uh, marine and uh, uh, the Japanese for for him, for himself, and and for his team. But uh, but a number of I I was surprised to read in in the, in the works that I have just recently brought myself to, to do. I was so bitter. Uh, I read that the founder of the, uh, or one of the founders of the Marine, uh, of the Montfort Point Marines, he said, all or nearly all Montford Point Marines have a mixture of pride and bitterness. Mm -hmm. And I said, that helped me some because I thought that maybe I was the only person like that. And it, because so many of the guys seem, and I've heard some of them talk, and they talked as though. Well, they were accustomed to it, and they seemed to have expected it. And I, I didn't expect it. I, I must say, I did not expect mm -hmm. to be uh, treated uh, that way. Uh, and but he, in analyzing it, I think my my pride was public. I had public pride. That is when I heard the, uh, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, uh, any band playing something charging from the ice, stay up. Mm -hmm. Are there any Marines in the house? Mm -hmm. As it did the other, yes. But privately, <laughs> what am I standing up here for? They don't consider me a Marine. They, uh, I wasn't treated as a, as a, as a real American. Mm -hmm. uh, that would always haunt me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get over that until, and this perhaps is near the end of my journey, one but two years ago, I think it was, I asked Laverne to look up Montfort Point Marines for me. She's computer wise, I'm not, I'm illiterate. And she found out where, where the, uh, that there was an association and that they were, they were going to have their 30, 41st, I think, convention. 41st. And I said, well, I think I'll go to that. Well, uh, 
she gave me the name of the uh, president of the association. I called him. He's in Philadelphia. We talked. He said, I'm going to send you some material. He sent me materials, uh, registration and all of that, and say, so it's a good time for you to, to, to join up because we're going to go back to where we started at Montfort Point, Camp Lejeune. And so she and I began to process papers and get ready for, to take this trip uh, uh, to uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina. I said, I want to see how that place is and all of that. And so we journeyed. When we got off the plane at, uh, was it Jacksonville? I've forgotten where, we, where, where did we, where was the plane? I've forgotten where it was, where the pilot was. I mean, where the uh, plane took us, or was it? I don't think there's an airport in Jacksonville, but wherever we landed, there were two Marines to meet those of us who were coming home, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that struck me was that they're together. There's a white Marine, a black Marine. Montreux Point, all services, uh, the uh, Marines are integrated now. And although this camp is now called, been named after one of the original and one of the legendary uh, non-coms, of the Marines, black Marines, white Marines and black Marines are now at Monfort Point. That I found salutary. But the thing that really transformed me was during our meetings, Commissioned officers, black commissioned officers were there. And although I knew they existed, it was a moving experience to see them and even more to go and speak to them and tell them what and awesome experience it was for me to see them. I say, you don't understand. There's no way I can help you understand what this means to me. Prior to that time, my service in the military had been meaningless. I couldn't find any meaning in what I had done, what I had gone through, none of it. It was an experience that wasn't lost upon me, but which I <laughs> wish somehow it would get lost. And I was talking to one he, he, uh, lieutenant colonel. And I, he, he's about my size and about my height. I said, you, and and look so young, <laughs> you know. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm as proud of you here as oh, you were my own son. You know, it, it, I said I 
I don't know how you can possibly understand what it means to me to see a Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel in the flesh when the highest a uh, person, officer I'd seen in the Marines was a, a gunnery sergeant and just got a glimpse of him mm -hmm. to see that. The transformation that has taken place, I said, it's so much. He said, and this it shook me up. He said, I want to thank you for making this possible. You those of you who went through that, and I had never thought of that, never in my mind had that occurred to me, that I made anything possible. I had just gone through some stuff that didn't mean anything to anybody, or certainly not to the country. It meant something to my parents. It meant something to me, the most meaningful thing that it meant to me, the most tangible thing that, that it uh, that the experience had meant to me was the fact that there was a GI Bill and I found a way of, to, to go to college. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing. But all the rest... This interview uh, is for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress with Joseph Hester Smith, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps from June 1943 to December 1945. Today is Friday, February 8, 2008. We are in the television studio of WILL on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana, Illinois. This is part three of this interview. My name is Harriet Williamson. Also in the studio are Henry Radcliffe, videographer and director of sound and lighting, and Mr. Smith's wife, Laverne Elizabeth Robert Smith. At this convention of the Montford Point Marines, I saw what really brought tears to my eyes when I sat and thought about it. And, and began to recall <laughs> the Montford Point early years to see all of these officers <laughs> in court. And the transformation began, and when they, everyone I talked to, thank you for making it possible. We, we know that had it not been for what uh, you early Montford Pointers went through, we would not be here. We would not have achieved what we have. And that was a poignant um, moment because I had never thought about any contribution that I had made to anything regarding the Marine Corps. To me, it had been an isolated moment which uh, still uh, caused me to be bitter and to feel wounded, and I rationalized it. <laughs> I even included it in my my prayers to, you know, to free me from 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 those feelings that seem on the surface so trivial, and yet I couldn't mm -hmm. shake them, and the. And that which enabled me to shake them was communicating with these young men and women. These they are adults, they're young compared to an 80, <laughs> 83, 84 year old person. But to see them so dignified and 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 and, and decorated and all of that, it was a great moment, transcendent moment for me, really. And 
from that point on, that wound <laughs> began to heal. It's not forgotten, but it no longer rubs me, and I can talk about it, and I can uh, I, I can face other Marines and 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 not feel uh, guilty or or feel inferior or any of those degrading things that I have been carrying around so many years because of little things but the main thing was what our officers didn't do on that train I mean, and if you can't respect you don't get the from your superior officers. They're called superior. <laughs> and w w I think it ought to be more than just a military uh, kind of thing. <laughs> Men of uh, virtue <laughs> and all these other kinds of things, which I assume the Marine would consider a part of being a good Marine, which they were completely lacking. I don't know any, I just can't conceive of, of an officer uh, not standing up for his men just to get some coffee and donuts. And I said, if, <laughs> if we're ever attacked, those guys will <laughs> scoot away mm -hmm. and leave us stranded somewhere. If they can't stand up uh, for a little, uh, against a little uh, Tupelo, chapter of the American Red Cross when there's nobody around but us. What can we look upward to from them? I cannot look up to that kind of person. I just simply couldn't. And that bothered me. And with the help of my wife, Laverne, in getting me connected with Montford Pointers, and I have since talked with some of those persons because heretofore I have never met another black Marine since the time, yes, one who was in the Marines but who was also uh, a friend of mine in, in boarding school, we met Marines. Mm -hmm. So uh, he and I have talked about it. But he took a shortcut. He, did, he got out of going overseas. Uh, he wanted to stay at home, and so he finagled his way into uh, uh, standing guard at, uh, I think, was Sun Shipyard or someplace in Philadelphia. So he mm -hmm. stayed home during the war. But he was one only person. After I left Boston to to start teaching, um, I taught in small towns. Um, I finished my my uh, masters at Harvard, and then started looking for a job uh, to teach. And I didn't want to teach in a large urban area. I wanted to teach English and I, I knew from what I saw in the Boston schools <laughs> that would be different unless I could get in certain schools. And I knew my chances weren't politically good for that. And so I began looking at, and Harvard did too, for small towns. And so our first after we left Boston, our first place was in Jackson, Michigan. And, uh, and I never met a black Marine in Jackson, Michigan. So I continued to harbor that and uh, those feelings. And we were there uh, seven years and no, 10 years. We were there 10 years, and then I received the call from the University of Illinois. They wanted 
a person with uh, with certain capacities and and certain uh, abilities to live in both worlds, as it was put, the black one and the white one, <laughs> to put it straightforwardly. And uh, <clears throat> what I'd been doing in Jackson, Michigan, they thought equipped me uniquely for the job that they wanted done here at the University of Illinois. I, uh, so once again, we're off to pioneering. Uh, again, I, I accepted the job and I was appointed assistant professor of English and assistant to the director of admissions and records because they wanted me to open up Chicago. The University of Illinois had been pushed and shoved by a member of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Jones, I've forgotten his first name, a lawyer from Chicago. He tried to get them to get more uh, African-American students uh, here. Other schools were doing it. University of Illinois, as usual, were standing back, reluctant, and he was pushing it. And they had been looking for somebody to sort of uh, be the front man for that enterprise. And they had been able to find the right one. They, I understand they've been going on for a year or two. And uh, the Dean of Admissions and Records came to Jackson, Michigan and asked uh, his son-in-law for such a person. And he said, I know one, but I don't think he wants to leave Jackson, Michigan for, uh, for teaching. I mean, he, he likes teaching, although I had become uh, language arts coordinator for the district. Uh, I love teaching. And that was why they gave me an appointment, <laughs> I think, <laughs> if, if it was sort of to entice me for the administrative job. So I. I enjoy teaching for uh, part-time and uh, working in admissions and records part-time. Got programs started. I won't go into that. That's another story itself. And experiences getting the university uh, committed or getting it the university active or genuinely active, that's an entirely different story and uh, one that will, that's almost as dramatic as my Marine Corps experience. But anyway, we uh, uh, worked there and then when the Chancellor, Chancellor Peltison uh, came here, or when Peltison came here as Chancellor, He'd heard what I was doing, and this was in accord with what he wanted to do. He had come back to the university uh, uh, from uh, uh, California, University of, of uh, California at Irvine, and he was, so he'd come back here to move the university forward, and he invited me to his office to come to his office and, and help him out. And it was the most it was the, the greatest thing experienced in my life because I never worked with a person who was, who was genuinely concerned. No, no, uh, oh, everybody else is doing it. Uh, let's, let's make a move. No, committed, uh, genuinely committed. And the thing that uh, was so difficult with it, 
was that there was not genuine commitment all around uh, every place else. Uh, the, when the president, <laughs> it was like, in many ways, it was like uh, President Roosevelt said, integrate uh, the services. Mm -hmm. You must admit black Marines. And they said, no, 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 a thousand times no. He said, you must do it. And he said, well, okay, with all, uh, we, we, we'll do it with all deliberate slowness. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that, 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 that's fine. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just, just so you know. That uh, Roosevelt Marine Corps experience is analogous to the president saying here, let's make a, 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 an effort to bring in minority students, bl black students, because they aren't coming to the University of, uh, of Illinois. And you've got all this deliberate slowness by all the, 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 the people who push it, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, dean's department heads and, and the committees, scholarship committees, and all of those kinds of things. <laughs> doing something, don't, don't bother us with that because we're doing this thing over here. And to get that, it had to come from somebody like Pelterson mm -hmm. because if, if it hadn't been for him, I would have left this place because it was, for, he, we prevailed. And, and uh, so it was a, <laughs> another uh, experience of breaking new ground, of another frontier. Uh, I told her, see, I was born, I, 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 I like my, uh, what, what is it, the astrological sign of Libra, uh, or October 5th, the, the nice little, the, the balance of scales, you know, uh, is, I think is a sign for mm. October 5th, uh, the balance. I said, I think there ought to be another one because all of my life I've been <laughs> uh, it's new situations. I just, I guess, people born in a certain time, if they, if they move from their the microcosm <laughs> of their little, little uh, of their little uh, neighborhood, uh, it's almost. It's new ground. It just happens to be, and that, and that's the way it has been with me. Everything seems to be uh, pioneering, You're starting all over again, just with another subject and for another uh, issue, another goal. It's, but it's all the same. But my Marine Corps experience, the most traumatic. I'm so pleased, delightful to be free of that. Tupelo, Mississippi incident. I don't think I would have been here talking to you <laughs> if, if, if I hadn't gotten over that. I, mm -hmm. well, I, I'm sure I wouldn't. I said, no, I wouldn't have. When did you meet your wife? Pardon? When did you meet your wife? Oh, happy day. <laughs> I was in college. I, I did my undergraduate work at Howard University. Oh boy, that's a story within a story. And my mother and father, as I told you, had uh, separated and eventually divorced when I was very young. And so I knew very little about my father, except uh, the bad things. Uh, and it wasn't from my mother so much uh, as from my aunt and my great aunt. Uh, my great aunt, the Aunt Beulah, the matriarch of 
with them. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have married him in the first place. She never married and couldn't understand why anybody would ever marry. So in the first place, yes, leave him. <laughs> you don't need him. And, and so I grew up with me. My father must have been a bad person. And my mother said, well, no, no, we had some irreconcilable differences. <laughs> and I laid down the law and told him he, he, he did something. Well, my father was an enterprising person, and during the Depression and all of this kind of thing, he, he was a manufacturer of illegal beverages, you know what it was, <laughs> and my mother couldn't stand that. This was during those days of moonshine, mm -hmm. he, he was a masterful person at that, something he had learned in his boyhood in Virginia. <laughs> it took me a long time to get around to be able to say that, but I know from history that a lot of families <laughs> were involved in those kind of things. And my mother just couldn't, couldn't stand it. She said, stop that kind of business. He had a restaurant and he was doing something. Stay in the restaurant business and fine. And we were doing well as far as I could tell. I remember having all kinds of little toys and things, but he, uh, that was why the divorce. And so the, uh, I wanted to find out something about the other side of my family, my father. I hardly knew him. And I had an aunt, his sister, and they would. And so I, I kept in touch with her. And I told her one, one summer I was in Boston, and I, looking, I looked around for a job, and I couldn't find it. And, and uh, and I didn't want to waste the whole summer playing tennis. Uh, so I wrote and asked her if she could find a job for me if I came to Maywood, Illinois, where I was born. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, uh, they're hiring at the American Can Company right down the street from me. Uh, the American Can Company was an institution in Maywood. Everybody. Practically everybody, male person, many uh, uh, females that worked at American Can. So you come and stay with me. I'd be glad to see you. And so I went to Maywood to see my aunt and get acquainted with my father. And on that particular trip, one day as I was talking to uh, a woman whom I remembered as a boy, I call her g uh, Dirt, Dirt, and she, uh, that she said, we call her Dirt. Her name was Gert, they call her, her name was Gertrude, and they call her uh, Gert, and it came out for me, she always said, it's Dirt. She would tease me, I'm going to come and give Dirt a hug. She had taken care of me a great deal, and so I was talking to her uh, and somebody else on one of the streets there, and I saw a young person coming down the street with some uh, jeans and a sloppy kind of shirt or something on, jeans rolled up, I think, for these. <laughs> First interesting person I'd seen. <laughs> well, it was Laverne and her, and uh, the woman, uh, Gert, Gert was is her aunt. Hmm. And our families had known each other, as I said, for forever, and my father, and her father, grown up in the same <laughs> woods <laughs> and around the same time, uh, I think a month or two apart, their births. And so they've been buddies all their life. So it was destined that we should come together. Mm -hmm. And we came together in a marvelous little Episcopal chapel in 
Maywood, Illinois. And there has been nothing but happiness ever since. And nobody will believe that. <laughs> but uh, with all that has happened uh, to us, with us, between us, we celebrated our 50... What the 56 anniversary. I, I lose count. 56 mm -hmm. anniversary uh, last December. December 27th, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we've. Uh, I've grown accustomed to her face. <laughs> Three marvelous children, firstborn Pamela, who is a graduate of the University of Illinois, uh, bachelor's and uh, what is it, business uh, uh, MBA in finance from the University of Illinois. She's now in Indianapolis. She married, unfortunately divorced, but she has, she has our only grandchild. We have a grandson, Christopher, whom we love. We, I wish he were, hadn't grown up so quickly <laughs> so I could Hugging more and more, but you know he's <laughs> too, too big for that. But uh, we see them rather often. Our second-born is a son, Daniel. Uh, we could not persuade him to go to the University of Illinois or any of the other places around here. Somehow he thought that since I was an East Coast person. He should go to the East Coast. And since I had left some footprints at Harvard, he should go to Harvard. I didn't think that he was quite the, he was a good scholar, but I didn't think he had the toughness, the scholarly toughness. Uh, I thought my daughter did. I tried to persuade her uh, to go, and she could have gone, but she, at that time, uh, Harvard uh, uh, admitted women through Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. They had to come, come by the way of Radcliffe. And she said, I will not go into any side door. And she, so she, she wasn't interested in going to Harvard. But I thought somehow she had the, it uh, wasn't just bright, it was kind of toughness that was required. But Daniel went and he survived it. I told him I wouldn't ask about his grades as long as he did it in four years, because <laughs> that's as far as I go. <laughs> so, so he was graduated with a illustrious class and all that. And he, he's making a living at, well, I don't know what my children do. They're all in computer things, and uh, they don't do any of the old-fashioned things. Uh, anymore, and and then is then there's the the little one, the the littlest angel, Jocelyn, who is the uh, she's married. Uh, I don't know, Daniel isn't married, but she married her, but married rather late, and so she couldn't bear us children. She went to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, decided she wanted to study journalism. I said, you know, why are you a journalism? Oh, I like to write. Oh, you can write. You don't have to go to journalism class writing. You aren't going to be a journalist, and you can't push your way into to uh, setting and get uh, get news. Or she's very, the most. Uh, I mean, quiet and. Generally, she can, 
She has some steel there, though, but uh, I didn't think that she was equipped for that. She said, well, I'm going to, I, I plan to do magazines. I don't know. I said, do you, you know what? You got to do, you're very lucky and a lot of writing before you can get a magazine. <clears throat> but she went in and it served her well, but she's doing some. Uh, computer things, and she's, and she uses, and she writes right now. She's the, <laughs> the the editor of her, uh, of her church paper. Uh, she's in uh, Virginia, uh, uh, Annandale, Virginia. At is it Grace uh, Episcopal uh, Saint Barnabas? Saint Barnabas. Mm -hmm. The Episcopal Church, and she is the editor of the newsletter, and they turn out a real newsletter, and not one of the little dinky uh, one page <laughs> folded over things. And she's in charge of that. She says, See, <laughs> journalism. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the one who helps me with my memoirs. And, well, I hope that you and have me. that published. Yeah, she pushes me into it. She's typed up some things for me, and she she keeps me at it. And I, so all of my children, and I love them for uh, their uniqueness. Uh, they're they're different, but they all uh, contribute to my well-being in different ways. Well, it has been a great honor to have you here and to hear your narrative. Thank you very much. Well, I hope that this makes sense to somebody. I, I don't know <laughs> when you're talking mm -hmm. how things will come out, but uh, c'est la vie. <laughs> Henry, did you want to ask anything further? Thank you.